story about the speech of uh, the leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, that um, he carried out this speech on uh, last Friday, um, November 3rd, I think it was. Hezbollah is the most significant uh, proxy of the Iranian regime. It's a very significant and powerful player. It's, its military capacity is 10 times bigger than Hamas and Islamic Jihad combined. And since day one of this war, there has been concern regarding the question whether the Hezbollah is going to enter fully to this war. Uh, I, since day one, I talked about the Iranian the Hezbollah dilemma vis-a-vis -vis the war. And I, I noted that actually the Iranian dilemma is, are they going to try to save Hamas because it's enormously significant strategic card for the Iranian regime uh, by sending the Hezbollah to the war trying to send Hamas? Or by doing that, they may jeopardize not only the downfall of Hamas, but also the, uh, an enormous damage to the Hezbollah? Or are they going to basically give up Hamas, give up this Gaza card with all the negative ramifications that comes for that as far as the Iranians are concerned. And one of the things that I said since the beginning of the war was that what we see is that we saw this, this very gradual, very well calculated military escalation by Hezbollah on the Israeli-Lebanese border. Uh, and also it was encompassed with some increasing of attacks against United States assets in Yemen, in Iraq, uh, in Syria, uh, conducted by other proxies of the Iranian regime. But those were very, you know, calculated, well calculated, very gradual uh, escalations on the ground that has been kind of like increasing, but not dramatically. And, and so today when we look at the Israeli-Lebanese arena, and the issue of the Hezbollah, what we see is this continuing and a little bit increasing skirmish between Israeli military forces and Hezbollah and other Palestinian uh, militias in the south part of Lebanon who are back, obviously backed by Hezbollah. But those skirmishes are, are, are confined to the area of, roughly speaking, the Israeli northern border, the Israeli-Lebanese border, and they are not expanding to a wider geographical arena and they are not expanding in the volume and intensity of the of the fight. Um, so, you know, in the, in the region, in the world, you know, uh, people noticed that Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, was was totally silent for almost a month. He didn't say anything. Uh, there were reports he was meeting with leaders of Hamas and Islamic Jihad, but he didn't came up speaking formally about it. And then he made a speech on Friday, and. And actually, when I looked at the speech, I obviously I followed the speech, I listened to what he said. Uh, Nasrallah is a, is, a, is, a, is a really master in mass psychology. You know, he can market whatever he wants to the masses. Um, he's a very sophisticated person, very vicious. Um, but in course of time, Nasrallah that was let's say about 15 years ago or 20 years ago, Nasrallah that used to be considered as an icon in the Arab world has lost its image because more and more in course of time, Arabs actually re realized that Nasrallah is an Iranian proxy um, and particularly his involvement, the Hezbollah's involvement in the war in Syria where the Hezbollah butchered thousands of Syrians, including civilians and others, uh, hatred and, and loath in the Arab world toward Hamas, toward Nasrallah and Hezbollah increased. Remember, Nasrallah and Hezbollah actually occupied Lebanon, an Arab state from within. They basically turned Lebanon into an Iranian satellite with their weapons and the terror methods. Uh, so Nasrallah is very much loathed in wide circles in the Arab world. And for Nasrallah, the speech, I was, uh, I've been watching Nasrallah for many years as part of my professional background and, and also in my capacity as a Middle East expert. And I could say that Nasrallah was really struggling. I mean, the speech wasn't fluent. 
the speech wasn't as venomous as Nasrallah can be. Uh, he, he, he mumbled a couple of times. He was misspelling words. Um, his rhetoric was moving anywhere between apologies and trying to repackage the fact that the Hezbollah is not intensively involved in the war with all kind of like uh, apologetic view. Um, he, the emotional expression in his, in his, um, in his speech was mostly reflecting to the best of my reading. It was reflecting particularly uh, his attempt to kind of like try and to package in a way uh, something that is a bitter pill for him. The bitter pill for Nasrallah is that, and obviously for Hamas and Islamic Jihad, the bitter pill is that one of the things that the Iranians and their proxies market constantly to the Arab world is part of marketing themselves as, is they, as if they are the ones that are going to liberate Palestine and all those slogans. One of the major concepts that they market was the story of this um, what we called in Arabic Wahdat al Sahat, which means the unif unifications or unifying the arenas. And the concept says basically, look, when, when the time comes and there's going to be a war, all, all brothers, you know, Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, the Iraqi Shiite militias, they will all stand together shoulder to shoulder to fight this war to eliminate Israel. Well, here is this big war, very big war, where actually it's very likely that in the end of this war, Hamas will lose its power in Gaza Street. And the Hezbollah is actually not really involved in this war. So this is the bitter pill that uh, Hezbollah and Hamas and Islamic Jihad needs to swallow because it's, it's already, of course, contributing to the amount of anger and, and, and uh, hatred of many people in the Arab world towards Hamas, towards Hezbollah and Nasrallah, towards the Islamic Jihad. And, um, you know, I, um, I was talking about the speech. Obviously, the speech has been, of course, analyzed from different perspectives and what was said and what was not said and so on and so on. One of the things that almost immediately captured my uh, attention again, because since I've been following Nasrallah for many years in Hezbollah, it was the, um, I noticed the script that was, when Nasrallah makes speeches, he very often has this script, uh, some kind of like slogans that are appearing on the script when he's talking. And, and I noticed the, that he was, he was quoting on that script a verse, a verse from the Islamic Quran. This is the Islamic Bible. Um, and it's, it's a verse that um, taken from a chapter in the Quran. It is called uh, the chapter of uh, Tawbah. Tawbah is, is a word with Arabic which means repentance or uh, remorse. And it's interesting that he chose that specific uh, uh, chapter because the meaning of this Tawbah, the, the repentance, is that actually a person made a big mistake and he has to now remorse because of the mistake. He basically defies Allah's will and now he has to, you know, repent and, and to remorse for, for his mistake. The way I read that was kind of like a, a signal of Hezbollah to Hamas to actually, and by the way, that signal was, I think, backed by a sentence that Hezbollah says, Nasrallah says in his speech, he says like, Hamas did not inform me about this, what they're going to do. And I'm, and I'm okay with that, he says. But, but, but that was interesting because in between the line, he basically said something like, um, he said to Hamas leader, he said, look, you, you made a unilateral act and you made a big mistake. Uh, you didn't consult me, you didn't coordinate with me. What he didn't say, but that is the continuation of what the sentence is that, well, you have to bear the consequences yourself. You, you can't expect to drag me to a war that I was not part of 
the decision and the initiating of this war. And indeed, the verse that uh, Nasrallah used to quote from that specific uh, chapter, the verse says, Allah yunsurkum alayhum, which means Allah, the God, will, will, will make you the victorious. Um, in other words, you know, you should anticipate a divine intervention to be victorious, but not necessarily um, our intervention. And so I think it, um, and by the way, to the best of my understanding, we are today, today a couple of days after the speech, uh, I've been again going over reactions in the Arab world, talking with people. Um, they basically reflect the same perspective. They are saying that was a, many of them are basically calling that there was a very dull speech by Nasrallah, which actually means, meant in the end of the day, basically to provide a, a, a series of excuses why didn't he really committed his commitment uh, and he's coming with all kinds of excuses and stories uh, basically trying to justify the fact that in the moment of truth uh, Hezbollah didn't show up he actually betrayed if you wish in the perspective of Hamas leaders he betrayed them um, and by the way Hamas leaders knew that I mean, there was a point already before the speech that they knew that Hamas, that Hezbollah is, uh, is not going to be participating fully in this war. Obviously, one of the things that we have to take into consideration that this, this Nasrallah speech is actually a deceiving speech and actually the, the Hezbollah will and plans to go full steam ahead. We have to take this, this uh, scenario into consideration. Um, again, I mean, when you look at the situation on the ground, namely when you see that Israel is in a full alert uh, along the border, uh, Israel sends a very clear message to the Hezbollah that if he's going to wage a war, uh, the consequences for Hezbollah in Lebanon are going to be severe. The U.S. presence in the region and the very clear American message is definitely something that Hezbollah and the Iranians cannot ignore and are not ignoring. And the situation in Lebanon. Lebanon is a crumbling state. I mean, if Hamas, if Hezbollah is going to participate full steam ahead in the war, uh, the meaning of that is that Lebanon comes to an end. Uh, this, what remains of this country will basically disintegrate. It may be encompassed with a civil war inside Lebanon, uh, which, by the way, presents Hezbollah as a challenge because then he will have to divert resources and attention to what's going on inside Lebanon. So, again, not negating the possibility that this is kind of like a, a speech that is deliberately supposed to mislead. And I know that some people are saying that, and this is definitely something that should be considered. But again, when I look at that from, and I look at the, some of the facts on the ground, uh, to the best of my understanding today, as of now, Iran and Hezbollah basically made a decision not to fully participate in the war. And, um, I found it difficult to believe that the more the war in Gaza Strip evolves and, and Hamas' downfall is becoming more and more imminent. I found it too difficult to believe that by then, when Hamas' downfall is imminent, at that point, Hezbollah will rush into a war trying to save Hamas. It's, I found it more difficult to, to believe. So my assessment as of now is that the Iranian and the Hezbollah actually took a decision not to involve uh, in full capacity in, in, this, in this war.